Good morning and welcome to the Fourth Watch. We're so glad that you've tuned in today. The pastor and I are so glad to have you with us. And uh, my name is Tim Davidson. And we have a special message for you today by a special guest speaker. His name is Dr. David Dickerson. And he spoke to us this week on the men of Issachar. And we're so thrilled to have him here. And he has a special message called Recognizing Our Enemy. So if you'll take your Bibles, please, and turn to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. We'll be starting with verse 10. Let's join the service already in progress. Joining us by television is a pa the pastor, the senior pastor at Peachtree Baptist Church. We're honored to have him here at Morningstar Baptist Church, uh, preaching to us now the third part of a series on spiritual warfare. And uh, those of you that are lost and do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're losing the battle. You may be at peace. The Bible says the strong man keeps his goods at peace, but you're losing the battle. But those of us that are saved... You're on the winning side, but it's still a struggle, still a contest. And uh, he's going to be preaching on that today and tonight. We encourage you to be here tonight at 6 o'clock. And those of you watching by television, we hope that you'll watch this program over and over again as you can view it. God bless you, sir. Dr. David Dickerson, Atlanta, Georgia, Peachtree Baptist Church. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning. It's a joy for me to be here this morning and to be in your presence and to witness the presence of the Lord Jesus this morning, the person of the Holy Spirit. What a blessing. I want to share with you that my purpose for being here these days is, number one, to glorify Jesus Christ. Amen. And number two, I love the people of God. And I have one passion, and that is to minister to them and to help them with their struggles. I surrendered to preach when I was 18 years of age. I started out pastoring at 26. I've been pastoring the same church now for 39 years. I've seen a lot of people hurt, and I've seen Christ giving victory to many hearts. And there's one thing that we need to understand. Yes, we are in a warfare. But the Bible teaches us that we win. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is that band of saints that have been blood washed saved by the grace of God, and are saved on purpose for a purpose. And that's to advance the cause of Jesus Christ and to bring glory and honor to his name. Amen. So I would start with this exhortation. If you're struggling, let me make it clear. When you are in a meeting that's dealing with the enemy and exposing him... The enemy is going to battle. But he don't want to be exposed. And if you'll be patient, I'm going to try this morning to pick up where we left off on last night in Ephesians chapter 6. And this morning we're going to look at recognizing our enemy. Now when I share this with you, it's repetitious, but I've learned as an educator myself through the years that the law of learning is repeat, repeat, repeat. I uh, had a dear saint of God say to me one time, just don't rehearse the whole previous message every time you get up. But we're looking at Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm asking you to stand with me in Ephesians chapter 6 is our scripture reading. I'll start with verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, 
and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, I call your attention particularly to verse uh, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's interesting that we have the army identified that comes against us, the army of Satan. And it's interesting that he tells us that we might be able to stand as a child of God with the whole armor of God against the wiles of the devil. So our enemy is the devil and his demon powers. We're going to talk about them this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the Word of God. Thank you for the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus. We realize that we battle from victory that was won for us at Calvary. And Lord, we would pray today that you'll speak clearly to our hearts that we might identify our enemy. Again, Father, glorify the Lamb of God in our midst, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and be seated. Last night when I left off, I pointed out to you that Ephesians teaches us much about our position in Christ, much about our riches in Christ, and how we must walk the Christian doctrine in our daily life. And I pointed out to you that the exhortation in chapter 5, verse 18, is to be filled with the Spirit of God. This is an imperative for the child of God. This is not an option. God has commanded us as born-again believers to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And he says those of us that are controlled by the Holy Spirit will be a people that have our families right. Those of us that have our lives controlled by the Holy Spirit will worship right. And it goes on and tells us that we will rear our children according to the Word of God by the grace of God and the help of the Lord. And every part of our Christian life is going to be right. And then all of a sudden he says... Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, for we're wrestling with powers of darkness. You say, preacher, why are you emphasizing that to us? When you're doing things right, Satan hates it. And I want to emphasize that as a church, I am convinced that God has his hand upon this ministry. I've now been here, this is the second time, and the first time I came was in a King James conference, and what a great blessing it was for me. And then this time in this men's conference, and now spilling over into Sunday, I am just absolutely amazed at the witness of the presence and the power of God here. You study the Word of God, but you don't study down the power of God. You pray down the power of God. Which tells me that there are in this congregation a praying people. And when we start out in this ministry to carry the gospel to the ends of the world and take care of our Jerusalem like you're doing here in Westchester, what a blessing it is to understand that when the attack of hell comes upon us, God is saying to us, as he did in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, through the, hand, the writing of Paul to the church at Ephesus, he said, a great and effectual door has been opened unto you. And there are many adversaries. Right. Glory to God. You know, 
what kind of lick you're getting in on the devil because of the kind of lick he's giving back. And you get in to see him in the boxing match. And he comes around with that left jab and lays it to that jaw. You know what's going to happen? If he's still standing up, he's going to try to give an equal lick back. I share with you, it's a revelation of God's very blessing to us that we are doing some right things. And I bless the Lord for that. And God would have us to understand we're not in this business of shooting our wounded. We take time and deal with our wounded. I speak a lot at a lot of veterans uh, meetings because of the fact that I'm a veteran. And one of the things that I appreciate about the Wounded Warriors Project, their motto is, the best thing we can do for those that have fallen is to take care of the wounded. May God help us to understand we're not just instructing people about the enemy so we can say we've got some more theological knowledge. We're out to understand the enemy that we can take care of our wounded. That we can be certain that tomorrow we'll still be in the battle. Hallelujah. I'm looking at the end of this journey. You say, Pastor David, why are you saying that? You're just 65. That's what I say all the time. I'm just 65. I don't know how I got here so fast. And I'm looking at this thing, and I know there's not many years left. But I wanted to count. Man, I wanted to count for Jesus Christ more than anything else. I look back, and I see God's grace starting me, and I see God's grace carrying me. But I also see a journey yet to be made, and I know his sufficiency is there. I watched your pastor as he sat on this platform and wept as his daughter was singing, and I thought as he was weeping, Lord, somehow let me minister to this pastor. Somehow let me minister to this people. I'm more concerned about ministering to your hearts than I am covering material. I have here a, a binder. It's 30-something lectures. So I'm having a hard time to decide how many 30-minute units and 40-minute units that I can take out of a whole semester's teachings. But I felt this morning that I needed to identify the enemy. Notice with us in the text. It says in verse 10, the only ones that can be involved in this warfare are the brethren. Lost people are outside of the family of God, and they're in bondage to Satan already, blinded by Satan. But what a blessing thing it is that we as the children of God, this thing stands out in my mind. God elected us, and God chose us to serve in his army. I didn't volunteer for this one until he elected me. And then once he put me in the army of the Lord Jesus Christ, I said, glory to God, I'm in the fight. Amen. Is there not a cause? Yes, sir. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. What is it to be strong in the Lord? It's to be clothed in him. I bless the Lord. Christ Jesus is our armor. Amen. And he is our sufficiency. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. The word stand here is a Greek word. It doesn't mean to just stand up. Thank God I'm standing up. That's not what he's talking about. It's to take a military stance. There's a position to hold your weapon in, and there's a position in hand-to-hand -hand combat that you are to take if you're going to win. Thanks be to God. He's telling us we can put on the whole armor of Jesus Christ. We can take a stand against the devil. Amen. He goes on to tell us that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, and he describes the devil as our number one enemy. And he says we can stand against the wiles of the devil. I have to be real careful about this. I'm from Georgia. And... Uh, 
we all have a different kind of accent. You travel through North Carolina and they still got another different accent. But some of the times it's not accents, it's just ignorance. And I was driving through North Carolina and I heard this preacher, man, he was going at it reading from this portion of Scripture. And he said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the willies of the devil. I said, I've been there. <laughs> it may not be pronounced correctly, but I've experienced the willies of the devil in my lifetime. What is this willies of the devil? <laughs> the wiles of the devil comes from the Greek word uh, methodia. It comes into our English language methods. The methods of the devil. And what's interesting is we as the children of God will learn something of the methods of the devil by just looking at what his names mean and looking at what the demons that are identified in four regiments are described as principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world and uh, spiritual wickedness in high places. First of all, I share with you that the devil is our number one enemy. It's interesting, he is diabolos, which literally means the accuser. It's significant that this wicked one who leads the armies of the fallen, he is one that is leading a rebellion against God. It's first a rebellion against God. And when you can't get to God, he turns to get to God's people. You notice the enemy always goes after the man of authority. In the church, the powers of hell are after the pastor. But if he can't get the pastor, he'll attack the pastor's children or the pastor's wife. Amen, that's the way it is. And in your home, if Satan can't get to you, Daddy, he will attack the wife and the children. Listen to me. He hates the authority of those that are put in a place that believe the Bible and follow the Bible. So the Bible teaches us that the devil was originally Lucifer. I don't have time to develop this. Don't even want to. I want you to study it out for yourself. But in Ezekiel 28, we have a record of his being Lucifer, the anointed cherub whom God placed in charge of his created earth. And in Ezekiel 28, verses 11 to 19, it says that he was one that also was gifted as a musical instrument. It's an amazing thing, pipes and wind instruments. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? I believe the music of heaven was directed by Lucifer before his fall. He was the chief cherub. And I guarantee you, as he was there leading the course of heaven, they were magnifying God with a standard in their music. Until one day, he sought to be exalted above God. And Isaiah chapter 14 tells us, and I believe that's a reference to him as well, the Bible tells us that he said, I will, I will, I will be exalted above the most holy. You don't say that in the presence of the Most Holy. Right. Right. Bam! Out of heaven straight to this earth. Jesus tells us in Matthew's Gospel, he witnessed it. Hallelujah. You say, preacher, what are you saying to us? You say, pride's not such a bad sin. It costs Lucifer his place in heaven. Pride is a sin that keeps us in unbelief. It is pride that binds us, and Satan uses pride as an instrument in bringing us down. Great was the day when God humbled me. In the day of his power, he brought me to the end of myself and brought me to humility. And he brought me down and brought me to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. And a submission to his lordship. But let me hasten. Satan still has access to heaven. He's required to go to heaven. He has to give an account to God for all he's doing. That was a part of the message last night. 
God is sovereign. This is not a battle between darkness and light. It is a battle where God is sovereign and Satan does exactly what God will allow him to do. He is full of rebellion toward God. And if he had his way, he'd kill every last one of us. But God won't let him. You say, how do you know that? Look at the book of Job. The Bible tells us that not at any time was Satan able to touch Job without permission from God. And by the way, it was God that picked the fight, not Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? Let me say to you, he could go no further than God would allow him. We've got victory already written out in the sovereignty of God if we believe it and will trust in Him and recognize that there is not one thing that could come into our lives by the powers of hell but what God first gives permission. Amen. And you say, preacher, that being the case, how does that help us? It helps us in the fact that He is going to always work good for us. Amen. Hallelujah. He could even use Satan to knock everything off of us that doesn't look like Jesus Christ. Amen. He'll humble us. He'll hurt, cause our hearts to hurt, but He will never, ever, ever destroy us. And I point out to you, it is a glorious thing to understand that God doesn't allow just everybody to go through a test like Job. So if you're going through a trial, it could very well be that God is just proving what you really are in Him. And the one thing that I know He's going to prove to you is that Christ is sufficient. Amen. Then I hasten to point out to you that Satan has to give an account to God but Satan is a master deceiver. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15 tells us he is an angel of light. It's revealing that his powers are deceptive. He is an angel of light. He transforms himself into an angel of light. What is an angel? An angel is a messenger. And Satan will transform himself into being God. You say, preacher, how does he transform himself into being God? In the deception of our minds. He'll deceive you. This charismatic, crazy world we're living in today where it's all experience and no word of God brings me to the realization that when they do get in the Word of God, they misinterpret the Word of God. Now get this. Satan is the deceiver. And people, if he can convince them, will convince them by experiences to trust the experience over the Word of God. That's the reason it's so dangerous for us to be full of feelings. Amen. Amen. There is worship that touches our hearts and our spirits. Amen. Amen. I've been made to worship in these days that I've been here among you. But let me say this to you. There is a soulishness that Satan can produce that will lead to deception and will have good feelings and not have any of God in it. And let me just say this to you. Everything that's supernatural is not necessarily of God. Satan's supernatural. And he will deceive you to thinking he's God. Well, let me go a step further. He's the destroyer. Revelation 9, 11, Apollyon. You say, what do you mean? If Satan had his way, he'd destroy this church. If Satan had his way, he'd destroy our homes. If Satan had his way, he'd destroy our sons and our daughters. Boy, I'm glad I'm a Christian. I'm glad I'm a blood-bought child of God and that I have the enabling grace and the power of God to help me with my family and with my church. Hallelujah. Amen. Greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. Amen. Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb. Thank God for Calvary. Amen. 
They overcame him by the word of their testimony. And I'm not ashamed of him, and you shouldn't be either. If you've been born again, declare it to the housetop, and go to the housetop and declare it to the mountaintop. But declare it, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Amen. And this is the truth that sets men free, but there is a destroyer that would destroy us if he could. They love not their lives unto the death. And when you put your life in the hands of God, you can rest assured he cannot destroy that life. If you lose your life for his sake, you gain it. Amen. Let me go a step further. Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now let me just say this to you. Here we have a beautiful illustration that helps us to understand something about the warfare we need. A lion roars to strike fear in the heart of the prey. <laughs> a roar has never killed any deer. <laughs> Unless he's afraid to the point that he panics and has a heart attack or something. Amen. You say the devil is roaring all around us. Yeah, glory to God. And he's on a chain. Pilgrim's Progress. I love it. <laughs> An old pilgrim's making his journey toward that celestial city. And he gets to a place that there's lines on either side of the road. And boy, they are roaring. An evangelist is on the other side saying, Come on, pilgrim, it's okay. Come on, just trust me. Stay on the path. Don't get off of the path. <laughs> and all of a sudden, pilgrim starts out. Step by step, he gets closer and closer to the lines, and they're roaring. To his astonishment, those lines were chained. And as long as he stayed on the path, he could go through in victory. Glory to God for the path. Amen. All we have to do is stay on the path of the Word of God as a child of God, and I promise you the enemy cannot destroy us. Right. All he can do is try to cause us to panic. Now here's the way. A lion will wait in the path waiting for the prey to come. And here comes the deer or whatever down the trail, and he roars. You know what a little deer will do when that happens? He panics. He either freezes in his tracks or he runs right into the jaws of the lion. Stay on the path. Amen. Don't be afraid of the roar. I hate the devil. Amen. I hate the devil. <laughs> But he can't do anything with my God. Amen. I am no match for the devil, but the devil is no match for my God. Amen. Glory to God. Satan, like a roaring lion. But here's one. Satan is an accuser of the brethren. The Bible says he's an accuser. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And here's where I want to talk for just a minute. Number one, he accuses us to God. And what he does is he goes before God and says, You know David Dickerson, pastor at Peachtree Baptist Church in Sonora, Georgia? He is a low-down rascal. He has failed you. And I do fail him. I don't want to stay there, though. Amen. And I'm glad I don't have to keep myself. He keeps me. Now, that doesn't mean I want to sin. And I'm not looking for a license to sin. I'm just simply saying I have an eternal high priest at the right hand of the Father that intercedes for me. And when Satan beats a trail before the throne of God, you see that David Dickerson down there? He's a failure. Some of you are sitting on the sound of my voice. You're feeling that this morning. The devil is just, just really accusing me before God or accusing me to myself. And I'll talk about that in a moment. 
But you get a handle on this, folk. Listen to me carefully. Jesus, our advocate, our lawyer, stands up and pleads our case before the court of heaven. God is not only just, he's a justifier. But he did it in a just way to retain his holiness. And so, my sin was imputed to Jesus at Calvary. But Jesus' righteousness has been imputed to me. So when the Father sees me, he sees me in Jesus. Thank God for the blood. The blood has been applied to my heart. And when the powers of hell accuse me before God, Jesus stands and pleads my case. I laid down my life for David Dickerson. Amen. Glory to God. You see, the key to this thing is understanding we have one sufficient to take care of the accuser of the brethren. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Right. Secondly, he not only accuses us to God, but Satan accuses God to us. How about this God that you've been serving? Here you are, can't make the bills, can't pay your bills, and if our economy and our nation keeps going like it is, we all may suffer some hard times. And who knows but what it's God's program to purge us. But let me say this to you. The enemy can accuse us, and it's a most... Dreadful thing, but when they accuse God to us, it's an effort to make us hopeless. Where is this God of sovereignty? Where is this God of power? And yesterday, one of the men came to me from over in Illinois. He came up to me afterwards and he said, Pastor David, pray for me. I lost my wife and I'm really struggling. But he said, I believe God is so good that he may give me another one. I said, he's that kind of God, brother. It's an amazing thing, the perspective that we have oftentimes on our battles. If you've got a God, you've got hope. Amen. Hey, listen to me. If when you come down in life and all you got left, you've lost everything, all you got is God and ashes, you got enough to start over. Amen. That's all you need. But when he makes us feel that God is not God, that he has forgotten us, that's a lie. All right, that's a lie. And he wants you to believe it. But then I hasten to point out to you, and this is important, he accuses us to one another. You know what his effort is? There she comes. She sits over there like she owns a church. And you know what? The pastor will call on her to sing, and you will have brought Flossie May to visit, and this dear sister couldn't carry a tune in a 55-gallon drum. We're not concerned about that. We want to sing beautifully. But if we can't carry a tune and we're singing with a joyful noise unto the Lord, oftentimes that brings great glory to God. Amen. And then there's that accusation against the brother. He gets to do everything. Yeah, we get you in the forefront of doing everything, you'll realize you're more subject to be attacked. But let me hasten. He accuses us to one another. And he will split a church. He's a liar. I'd rather, I always believe the better for every situation that comes to me. My mother was an eternal optimist. She's in heaven now. But she could find some good looking in the bottom of a garbage can. She beat all I ever seen. She'd look at me and she'd say, I'll tell you the good thing about this thing, we can put some more of this nasty stuff in there and put a lid on it. <laughs> She'd find some good out of everything. Why is it that we always look for the best? Do you know gossips love the worst? Okay. 
Let me, let me go a step further. Satan will accuse your brother to you or your sister. But another thing he'll do, he will accuse you to yourself. You really messed up now. When everybody finds this out, you're done. You'll never sing in the choir again. <laughs> I hate that. For that person that might be here, he tells me I'll never preach again. I'll never open another door for you. You're just, you're just mediocre. Well, I knew that all the time. <laughs> Amen? Amen? It's dumb for us to sit around and think, well, I'm really something. Yeah. Amen. If there's anything something in Pastor David, it's Jesus Christ and the power of God. Amen. That's the whole story of all of us. Amen. Amen. I will arise in the power of that whole armor of Jesus Christ. And if I have wronged, I beg forgiveness. And not only do I beg God's forgiveness, I beg God give me grace to forgive myself. And believe in the power of that shed blood. And believe in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And arise, take up the whole armor again, and get back in the battle. Satan is our enemy. And let me conclude here. I won't get to the demon powers. You'll have to come tonight to get that. But Satan is our adversary. 1 Timothy 1.20 He is the devil. He is a murderer and liar. John 8.44 He's called a dragon. A monster. In Revelation 12, 7, and Paul said in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, he said, we wrestled with monsters. We have wrestled with all kinds of wicked forces. He's called a lion. He's called a serpent. He is Beelzebub. It means he is the Lord of flies and filth. Lucifer literally means day star. And the wicked one is another title. He is the tempter. He is the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the prince of the power of the air and the prince of this world. He is also called Belial, means baseness, vileness, and worthlessness. These titles not only reveal Satan's character and personality, but they reveal his power. We have a real enemy. Now tonight I want us to look at these principalities, and we'll look at some battles. If I were to just summarize this, we have three enemies. The devil, the world, and the flesh. Amen. My worst enemy is my flesh. Because Satan can use my flesh to battle me. Amen. But he also can use the world to battle me. The world system. How do we overcome the devil? We resist him in Jesus' name. How do we overcome the world? We overcome the world by renewing of our minds. We came into this world being conformed to it. Now we're renewing our minds. But lastly, we overcome the flesh by reckoning it dead. Amen. There's four traps that I want to deal with tonight. One trap is the occult trap. We've had an invasion of witchcraft in America that's absolutely astounding. We'll talk about it. I go to Asheville, North Carolina and preach a lot of meetings. In fact, I'm due there about week after next to preach. And that place has been taken over by witchcraft, Wicca. Guess who else went along with them? The homosexuals. Are you with me? Occult. Secondly, religious trap. The devil don't mind you being religious. He just don't want you to get saved. Thirdly, there is the sin trap. 
Amen. But there's a way out. And we'll talk about it. You get in that sin trap, he'll keep you in a circle. You get some victory and then he will beat you down and accuse you against yourself. And you'll think, what's the use? And you'll sin again. Yeah. Oh, but there's a higher plane. Amen. And then lastly, the suicide trap. You say, preacher, what are you saying? Suicide, if it's not organic because of some physical problem, it's demonic. I counseled them and worked with them, preached their funerals. You say, what are you saying? Satan got a stronghold. And they just couldn't ever see that Christ was sufficient to deliver them. My prayer is that we as individuals will understand greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. We have an armor and we can be cleansed and we can be recharged and recommissioned. Let's stand. Esther. What a great sermon, Dr. Dickerson, and you've been watching The Fourth Watch, and that message, you know, recognizing the enemy, understanding what's going on in your life, and it could be those of you that have sat there, you can't believe what God has sent into your home. This may be the turning point for you, your marriage, your family, but you're going to have to recognize the enemy, and even though your husband may be a jerk, it's not your husband, is it? It's the devil. And Dr. Dickerson, that was a great message. And what about these people out there that are sitting there listening to this message, and now they recognize the enemy, and uh, maybe you could reiterate, what do they do now? There is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the key to the whole thing. Uh, thanks be to God, we have a real enemy, mm -hmm. and he battles us hard. But thanks be to God, Christ Jesus at Calvary defeated Satan, sin, and death. And we have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would encourage all of you that are there that's in this area that are struggling with warfare, there is a place of refuge in Christ Jesus. Amen. And you need a good Bible preaching church. Amen. And I recommend to you Morning Star Baptist Church. And if you'll get here this morning, you'll get to hear another message on the spiritual warfare and how we victor have victory in Christ. Amen. I'll tell you what, also, too, I'd rather have the devil as my enemy than God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Because God's going to win. Now, Dr. David Dickerson pastors the Peach Tree Baptist Church in Sonoya, Georgia, which is just a little bit southwest of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And then the Georgia Baptist College. Uh, what a tremendous college. Now, if the folks wanted to get a hold of the church to, to attend Peach Tree Baptist or Georgia Baptist College, how, what would be the best way to get a hold of you? Well, of course, we have a website. You can go on the website. Okay. It's peachtreebaptist.org. Uh, and uh, that way you can find out about the college and also the, the church. But also, uh, I, I might add uh, the phone number, okay. 770 uh, excuse me, 770-599-0888. Okay, give that one more time, 770-599-0888. Man, I hope you'll get in touch with them. And then if you live in the Cincinnati area or you're visiting through southern Ohio, get a hold of us. Let us know how we can help you. Our webpage, msbc.com, or you could get a hold of us by uh, your GPS, 7000 Summerhill Drive, Westchester, Ohio, 45069. We would love to see you come, 1030, 6, every Sunday, and then on Wednesday night, 730, our Bible study. We're excited. In fact, in um, early December, we're going to start a new series on Wednesday night, Heaven and Hell, Heaven and Hell, mm -hmm. what the Bible teaches on that. So I appreciate you. Brother Tim Davidson, of course, and I will be with you next week. We're excited about what maybe God's doing in your life. I believe that you could be a potential Christian or a potential champion for Christ. Amen. And so please let us know how we can help you. See you next week. Thank mm -hmm. you.